everybody, and welcome to the JDRF Type 1 Nation Summit. I hope you guys are having an amazing evening. My name is Jordan Liggins-Robinson, your host, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us this evening. I was diagnosed with T1D at 23 years old, and I'm a sports journalist and broadcaster with an emphasis in women's basketball and women's sports. So this is my jam. It's Women's History Month. And tonight is the second session of our four-part virtual series titled An Intimate Conversation, Visionary Women Talk Career, Balancing T1D, and Women's Health, all of my favorite things. In honor of Women's History Month, healthcare experts and female trailblazers will share their stories, talk about their careers, and discuss managing T1D and its impact on relationships, body image, pregnancy, and so much more. We'll also pay a special tribute to the award-winning actress and T1D advocate, the late Mary Tyler Moore. The Type 1 Nation Summit program offers education, connection, and inspiration on a variety of important topics to help you and your loved ones live well with T1D. Throughout the year, we'll offer virtual sessions like tonight, as well as many in-person summit events hosted by JDRF chapters across the country. If you'd like to stay up to date on our virtual sessions, please register. We'll post a link in the chat. Our lovely Grace will be managing the chat today. You can also visit the same link to find an in-person Type 1 Nation Summit event near you. Before we get started, I'd like to extend a special thank you to our national industry partners. Their support helps make Type 1 Nation Summit program possible. There are many options available to you and your loved ones manage and lessen the burden, the daily burden of T1D. JDRF does not endorse any specific product or brand and would encourage you to visit JDRF.org to learn more about all the options available to you and your family. We also encourage you to speak with your healthcare provider to discuss the options and a treatment plan that would work best for you and your loved one. Okay, now that we got that out the way, let's get started. We have so many great guests for you today. We'll start with our first first guest. But also, make sure you're sending this link to all your friends and family. If you're joining this and you're already having a good time, make sure to send the link to everyone, your neighbor, your best friend, your BFF, everybody, okay? So let's get started. Let's introduce our very first guest, Cassandra Bazil. Dr. Cassandra Bazil is an immunologist with expertise in autoimmune disease. She earned her PhD in microbiology and immunology from the University of Miami before joining JDRF as a scientist in 2021. At JDRF, Dr. Bazil works with academic and industry labs to develop immunotherapies that delay, stop, or reverse the progression of T1D. Outside of biomedical research, she strives to create equal opportunities for women and underrepresented minorities in STEM. Ladies and gentlemen, please show a warm welcome to Dr. Cassandra Bazil. Thank you, Jordan, for that wonderful introduction. I'm so excited to be here today to talk to everybody about JDRF's research strategy and, of course, the work that's being done in disease-modifying therapies, particularly by women scientists who are making an impact in the field. So with that, um, I'll introduce myself again. My name is Dr. Cassandra Bazil, and I'm a scientist, part of the CURES program at JDRF, where I help academic and industry labs develop um, disease-modifying therapies for T1D. Next slide, please. So JDRF has a mission of improving the lives of people with T1D by accelerating breakthroughs that cure, prevent, and treat T1D. And JDRF does this through its research strategy, which is comprised of two main core programs. The first program is the CURES program, and the second program is improving lives. The CURES program consists of three project areas, which is global universal screening, disease-modifying therapies, and cell therapies. To talk a little more about these programs a little more in depth, global universal screening focuses on identifying people who are at risk of developing type 1 diabetes. Disease-modifying therapies focuses on developing therapies that can prevent, halt, or reverse type 1 diabetes. And cell therapies is focused on identifying beta cell replacement um, therapies for people with T1D. 
Moving on to Improving Lives program, the Improving Lives program is focused on improving the lives of people who currently have type 1 diabetes through adjunctive therapies, devices, as well as psychosocial interventions. And lastly, a part of the strategy that JDRF that we um, prioritize and pride ourselves on is the training of researchers and clinicians who are dedicated to T1D research. So I'm going to be talking about disease modifying therapies because that's the project area that I'm most focused on. So to start off by saying what disease modifying therapies are, these are therapies that change the course of disease and they're aimed at people at every stage of T1D. And this is from people who have stage one type one diabetes where you have normal blood sugar and start to present autoantibodies all the way to stage four type one diabetes where there, you have established um, type one diabetes. The goal of the disease modifying therapies project area is to prevent, halt, or reverse the loss of beta cells. And this can be done by, um, by developing therapies towards either the immune system, beta cells, or both. So to talk a little more about the immune system, JDRF has dedicated a lot of time and resources into, under into understanding the role that the immune system plays in T1D. And this was most um, seen by the recent approval of the first disease-modifying therapy to treat type 1 diabetes, t also known as teplizumab. t is is meant for people who have stage 2 diabetes um, and prevents the onset or stage 3 diabetes by at least two years. And this work um, that teplizumab, um, teplizumab has been in the pipeline for a very, very long time at JDRF. And as you can see at this timeline, we've been invested in understanding how teplizumab is able to delay T1Ds for a very long time. Um, what's not shown in this timeline is currently teplizumab is being tested in people who have stage three diabetes or people who have um, recent onset diabetes. And we're hoping to see if teplizumab is able to prevent beta cell death as well as um, restore beta cell function. As we progress towards finding ways to prevent, reverse, and cure T1D, none of the, pro none of the progress that we've made in the disease modifying therapies project area would be possible without the contributions of the several female and women scientists that we fund through JDRF. Here I'm highlighting three scientists who have very impactful research at JDRF, starting with Maki Nakayama. She's at the University of Colorado, where she's working to identify types of T cells, which is the type of immune cell, and how these T cells are able to cause pancreatic destruction that leads to T1D. Megan Levings at the University of British Columbia, where she is part of a team involved in a clinical trial that's testing the use of the drug ustekinumab to block inflammatory proteins that enhance autoimmune disease. And Mikey Sanders is in Berlin, where she's working to understand the processes that underlie the formation and proper function of insulin producing beta cells. And she's also the recipient of a very prestigious award named the Albert Reynolds Award for her outstanding contributions in the field. JDRF does a lot of work to not only support these women scientists early in their careers, but help keep them in the field and by helping fund their research as well as promote their academic successes. So the three female scientists that I just, um, I just highlighted are only uh, a fraction of the women scientists within the DMT portfolio. Um, we fund dozens of them and they make a huge impact in the field. Um, as well as towards therapies, towards T1D. And with that, I'll end my talk and just want to thank everyone for being a part of this wonderful panel. Thank you so much, Cassandra. Wow, I know that you guys are killing the game. Thank you for all the work that you do. Just as a type one diabetic, I know that I'm going to be a recipient of all the hard work and research. So thank you, thank you, you're killing it. Go girl. <laughs> okay, we are going to move right along to our next woman who is doing amazing things. Our next guest is Dr. Sarit Polsky, MD from Colorado. Dr. Polsky is an associate professor of medicine and pediatrics at the University of Colorado's 
Medical Campus. She is the director of the Pregnancy and Women's Health Clinic at the Barbara Davis Center Adult Clinic. Dr. Polsky has maintained a consistent interest in women's health with a focus on how diabetes affects women during reproductive years, pregnancy, menopause, and postmenopausal stages. She provides clinical care in pregnancy with the support of a large multiple disciplinary team at the BDC. She works together with her patients to provide a comprehensive care plan, taking into account medical expertise, patient safety, and overall quality of life. Two of Dr. Polsky's main research topics are the use of advanced diabetes technologies in and outside of pregnancy and the long-term effects of gestational hypertensive disorders on women's health. She has been a principal investigator or co-investigator on numerous clinical trials evaluating technologies and in individuals with type 1 diabetes, like me. These studies include advanced diabetes technologies such as the CGM system, insulin pumps, and artificial pancreas therapies. I'm so excited to hear more about that. Dr. Polsky is the principal investigator for the first study in the United States approved by the FDA to examine artificial pancreas technologies and pregnancies associated with T1D. Please welcome Dr. Sarit Polsky. I'm so excited to hear about all of this. This is fascinating. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. I'm so <laughs> excited to be here with all of you. Um, let me see if I can get my slides up. Okay, so I'm gonna be focusing on three topics related to women's health. First, I'm going to discuss menstrual cycles. With this, in all of these topics, I'm specifically discussing type 1 diabetes as well. So just to first orient us, there are um, multiple stages of the menstrual cycle. The first is the follicular phase. This is when the follicle within the ovary is developing. It's about the first half of the cycle. It's the one part of the cycle where the duration can vary from 14 to 21 days. It's the time when bleeding starts up until ovulation. Ovulation is the midpoint of the cycle, and this is when the one follicle or egg is released from the ovary. And then the luteal phase is the final cycle. It's the last 14 days, and this is when the corpus luteum, which is the remains of the released follicle within the or or ovary, decays, and then the uterine lining thickens. During the course of the menstrual cycle, there are variations in our hormonal regulation. So estrogen is the predominant hormone in the follicular phase. Luteinizing hormone or LH is what causes the ovulation. And then progesterone is predominant in the luteal phase. Women with type one diabetes experience much more menstrual irregularity where they can have skipped periods or a delayed in onset of periods. And during the actual menstrual bleed, they can have a lot of glucose variation. And so it can go up, it can be the same, or it can be lower depending on um, the woman and the point in the cycle. The glucose variability over the cycle can vary and not every woman has a consistent pattern. So in studies where they've measured glucose variability from cycle to cycle, only about half of the women had a consistent pattern that showed up every month. The most common pattern that was seen was luteal phase hyperglycemia and high glucose levels in the weeks just before the bleed, so one to two weeks before. And this is predominantly from that um, progesterone that induces insulin resistance at that point in the cycle. How do we overcome some of the challenges? It can be really difficult. I mean, some of the challenges include the fact that um, with high glucose levels, the menstrual cycle can start a little bit later women can actually get missed periods from it. And also there's been data that shows that with a higher glucose level, an A1C of 9% or more, that there's more menstrual dysfunction or dysregulation. So one way to overcome the challenge is a hormone-based contraception can actually help stabilize cycle variability and symptoms, though you should consult a medical professional if you're considering this. And you can also help identify whether you're a woman who has a consistent cycle by measuring either finger stick glucose levels or using a continuous glucose monitor and measuring those glucose values over the course of three consistent cycles, one after the other, and then seeing if there's a pattern that emerges. 
and then trying to control those glucose levels so we don't have extreme lows or highs over the course of the cycle. The next topic I'll discuss is pregnancy. So uh, one thing I want to mention is that about half of pregnancies in the world are unintended or unplanned. It's a very common situation. So even if you're not intending to conceive, it's really important to discuss um, contraceptive health and reproductive health with your provider at multiple times over the course of your reproductive health lifespan, because sometimes surprises happen. <laughs> And planning ahead in type 1 diabetes can help ensure a safer pregnancy for you and the baby. Our glucose goals in pregnancy are optimally to have an A1C under 6.5% at the start of the pregnancy and then under 6% second and third trimester. With fasting glucose levels, which means overnight and before meals that are under 95 and after meals no more than about 130 or 140 milligrams per deciliter. But we only want to aim for this if we can do it without significant hypoglycemia. So if a woman's having severe hypoglycemic events, we relax those targets. One of the tools that can help is a continuous glucose monitor or CGM. This is when you insert a sensor into the skin and it measures glucose in between the cells underneath the skin every five to 15 minutes and wirelessly transmits that glucose value to a receiver, an insulin pump, a smartphone, a smartwatch, um, so that you can get real-time glucose va values. And in people who wear a CGM who are not pregnant, we're aiming for an optimal time and range of 70 to 180 milligrams per deciliter, more than 70% of the time. But in pregnancy, that range becomes smaller and lower. So at that point, we're aiming for 63 to 140, more than 70% of the time in women with type 1 diabetes, but not at the expense of having too many lows. So less than 4% of values under 63 in hypoglycemia and less than 25% in hyperglycemia, which is more than 140. And I just want to also point out that just like in the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle, estrogen and progesterone are both predominant uh, in the last half of pregnancy, and they can induce, particularly progesterone, can induce insulin resistance and change how much insulin requirements um, are maintained. So in fact, in the first part of pregnancy, women tend to be very sensitive to insulin, and we may have to reduce their insulin doses by as much as 20 or 30% compared to pre-pregnancy. Around 14 to 20 weeks, the hormones of insulin resistance kick in, and we need more and more insulin to the point where at the time of delivery, a woman may be using 300% more insulin compared to pre-pregnancy. And then immediately after baby and placenta are delivered, those insulin requirements plummet once again, and that can be even lower than in the insulin sensitive phase of pregnancy. Now, the reason why we try to so tightly control the glucose levels is because of the risk of adverse health outcomes. This includes fetal loss, like a miscarriage or stillbirth, preeclampsia, which is the development of high blood pressure in pregnancy, plus damage to another organ, like the kidneys, the liver, or the blood clotting system, an increased risk for an operative delivery, which is called a C-section, for neonatal intensive care unit admissions or NICU admissions, for an abnormally sized baby, too small or predominantly with type 1 diabetes, we may see too large of a baby, jaundice or dangerously low glucose levels in the infant. So that's why we try and control things so tightly. And I think one of the most important messages for women with type one diabetes is I know this is overwhelming and I know that it's very stressful, but I always tell my women, you can have a happy and healthy pregnancy. You're just gonna have to work harder than someone who doesn't have diabetes. And in addition to that, you don't have to do it alone. In fact, you should do it with a multidisciplinary team. And one of the tools that can help is CGM. So in CGM, it's been shown that in a trial where they gave people a random assignment to do finger stick glucose testing or wear the CGM, that wearing a CGM consistently reduced the size of the infants, reduced the risk that they were too large, reduced the risk that they had dangerously low glucose, that they needed the NICU admission, and it reduced the infant length of stay by one day. These are really important health metrics for the baby. And the A1C in the two groups at the final endpoint was only about a 
0.18% difference between the groups. So all these benefits for the baby are derived from the fact that wearing the CGM helps improve the maternal time in range and reduce time spent above range. And then this is that multidisciplinary team that I was telling you can help manage a type 1 diabetes pregnancy. A high-risk obstetrician, an experienced diabetes provider, certified diabetes educator, registered dietitian, nurse. It's also recommended that you have an eye exam once every trimester and then other specialists and as needed. So you can have a happy, healthy and pregnancy and you don't have to do it alone. And finally, menopause. Um, I just wanna highlight two points here about menopause. The first is that a lot of the symptoms that women have when they have diabetes are mimicked or the same as when they're going through the menopausal transition. It makes it very confusing. So sweating, for example, you can have with a low glucose or with hot flashes and night sweats. Anxiety can happen with low glucose or with menopause. Uh, vaginal dryness is common to both conditions. Blunted concentration or mental activity. So sometimes it's difficult for a woman to know that she's actually going through this transition because she's having symptoms that she had before with her type one diabetes. So just be aware of that. And then the second thing that I wanna highlight that I feel like gets very little attention is bone health. Um, so there was a very elegant study done by one of my colleagues, Dr. Shaw here at the Barbara Davis Center, where they examined women with type one diabetes and they were looking at their bone quality. And the reason they wanted to do this study is what I'm showing you in the images on, on the lower part of your screen is that in women who had type two diabetes, they found that they had more porous bone. There were sort of more holes in the bone. It wasn't as dense and as strong and as tightly packed together. And they wanted to see if this was also true for type one diabetes. And so they found that in fact, first and foremost, the risk of fracture was reported to be higher in the women with type one diabetes compared to controls, 79% versus about 46%. Secondly, the standard measurement for bone health is called a DEXA scan. And that measures bone mineral density. And in fact, that didn't show any differences between the controls and the women with type one diabetes. But when you do a special high resolution CT, looking at bone quality, you see that actually the women with type one diabetes had reduced bone quality and reduced bone strength. So DEXA may underestimate fracture, fracture risk, and we should be paying attention to our bone health before and after the menopausal transition. And those were the topics I wanted to highlight for this Women's Health Talk. Thank you so much for listening, and I'm happy to take questions. Wow, I'm over here. I was just frantically doing all my notes um, because I learned so much. And I know that this is for the ladies because I, I wanted to know all of this information too. The first question that I had before we get a question from the audience on the screen is you mentioned a CGM, which, you know, and I'm asking for myself because I want to become a mom in the next couple years and I'm trying to get that A1C down. <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying. But do you recommend an insulin pump during pregnancy? Because maybe not because you're using so much insulin. That's a really great question, Jordan. I, I think when it comes to the mode of insulin delivery, whether it's shots or an insulin pump, it's a very personal decision and it's one you should discuss with your healthcare provider. What I can tell you is there have been a lot of studies that have looked at insulin pump therapy compared to multiple daily injections. And the results are not always consistent. More recent studies are showing that women using the pump had a lower risk of having hypoglycemia, and it's really important to prevent hyper, hypoglycemia in pregnancy, and pretty comparable results in terms of their A1C and glycemic control. I personally feel like there are some benefits of pump therapy that should be considered. We can transiently or for a short period of time cut off insulin or increase it in pregnancy when we use a pump. But if you take a shot, I can't take away insulin that you've already delivered. So that makes mm -hmm. it a little harder. We also have to change the carbohydrate to insulin ratios and the correction factors or insulin sensitivities almost every week in pregnancy. And sometimes it's hard to remember like, okay, I have this for breakfast, this for lunch, this at dinner, this at bedtime, this is my rate for carb ratio, this is my rate for correction factor. And the pump kind of remembers all of that. And then there are actually integrated systems of pump and CGM that provide automation that may or may not be beneficial for some women during pregnancy. Oh, 
Well, there you go. I don't know how, how are you going to battle pe pregnancy cravings like you've seen in the movies when you're like, okay, can I have the milkshake from McDonald's and the french fries? And that, that's just not our life as a type <laughs> 1 diabetic, I guess. <laughs> um, are there any questions from the audience? Please drop your questions. Okay, we have one from Nikki. Are we finding that women in menopause have more insulin resistance? Yes, in general, yes. And in fact, in women who don't have diabetes, menopause can induce diabetes, type 2 diabetes. So it is a stage of insulin resistance in one's life. Mm. Okay, it's fascinating that it's the similar um, side effects of when you're getting a low blood sugar of when you're in menopause. So by that time, I'm gonna be like, Oh, I'm used to this. I know how to I know how to battle this. Is there another question from the audience that we can answer? Yes, from Joanne, should postmenopausal T1Ds ask their doctors to order a special type of bone density scan? Is there a name for this special type of scan? Joanne, that's a great question. I wish at the, at the current time, the only way to look at the bone quality is through participation in a research study, at least as far as I'm aware. It's currently not standard of care to do these high resolution CTs that I showed you. However, and I think that there are still things that can be done. So vitamin D is very important for bone health and that can be measured before, during and after the menopausal transition. So we wanna maximize that to make sure that, not maximize it, at least make sure it's in the normal range to make sure that we're fortifying bones. Doing weight bearing exercises helps strengthen the bones as well. So things like walking with weights that can actually help or weight lifting can help strengthen the bones. And the other thing I'll say is that women who developed diabetes before the age of 20 are most vulnerable to poor bone quality and they should pay a special attention to their bone health. And then, you know, in terms of high impact sports, we love for women with type 1 diabetes to be physically active. If they do have compromised bone quality or actually bone mineral density, that's maybe a point where we have to consider not doing something where there's a higher risk for fracture in terms of like a specific sporting event or something that if you have a high impact fall, you could get a fracture. Oh, that is fascinating. I think we have time for one more. Let's get one more because I want to answer all these questions. Great question, Amelia. Does diabetes affect fertility? Yeah, that is a really good question. So there's nothing inherently about diabetes that affects fertility. Women with diabetes can have children. There is some data from earlier on that I think if we maybe reproduce now, we wouldn't see the same result, that high glucose levels can shorten the duration of the fertile period so that women with type 1 diabetes may get their first period a little bit later and they may have menopause a little bit earlier. So the reproductive health lifespan is shortened by about six years. Now it's possible with modern technologies like artificial pancreas therapy and others, that's not the case because we don't have as much high glucose as we used to before we had really advanced insulins and really advanced technologies, but that study hasn't been reproduced. So I don't know that for sure, but in terms of the ability to have children, you can absolutely have children with diabetes. I think there's a lot of us that needed to hear, hear that phrase from you, Dr. Polsky. Thank you so, so much for your knowledge and sharing all of this with us. Thank you, thank you. We really enjoyed you. Thank you, doctor. So happy to be here. Thanks. All right. Well, I hope you guys took some notes. Get your pens out because we still have more to come. I want to introduce our next guest. I'm thrilled to introduce our next guest, Portia Bimbo, who has discovered her love for sports and philanthropy at an early age. Currently, she holds the position of manager of community impact in the NBA Atlanta Hawks, adding to her extensive professional background with distinguished organizations such as the Mercedes-Benz Stadium, Georgia State's Athletics, Indiana University Athletics, the Atlanta Dream, hey WNBA, and the NFL Atlanta Hawks. Portia's love for sports and the community extends beyond her work as she volunteers and collaborates with sports-related organizations, including the Atlanta Entertainment Basketball League and the I Hoop 2 Foundation. Having played college basketball, Portia's competitive spirit remains evident through her hobbies. When she's not in the gym, she can be found playing kickball. I love that. 
with two master's degrees, one in clinical psychology from UND and another in sports administration from Georgia State. Portia's most significant achievements include being a loving wife and a devoted mother to her son, who she affectionately calls Pima. Living with T1D for 24 years, Portia bravely navigates the disease one day at a time and aims to inspire others to live healthy and fully living their lives by sharing her journey. I had the pleasure of speaking with Portia a few days ago about her career, T1D, and her desire to grow her family, among so many other things. Let's take a listen to this conversation. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so excited to talk to you. I can't wait to hear your story. How are you? I am fantastic. I am excited about being here, um, and I can't wait to share my story. Yay! Uh, I can't wait to hear it. I know everybody can't wait to hear it. I want to start with you being a sporty girly, just like me, after my own heart. You can see I got some basketball earrings know, on just so for you. <laughs> just for you. So when did your love of sports start? Where did it all begin? Yeah, so I started playing basketball at five years old. Um, I'm from Savannah, Georgia. And so, you know, youth basketball is a really big thing there. And my parents put me in basketball and I've been playing ever since. Tried some other sports, you know, softball until I was in the eighth grade. Um, I even did creative dance um, and I did cheerleading. And so the dance and the cheerleading kind of fell off. <laughs> um, <laughs> softball fell off once it became fast pitch. And then I stuck with basketball and started playing volleyball in high school as well. Um, played basketball in college, too. Oh, I love that. After my own heart, um, I also played basketball, started also when I was five. So I love that for us. Yes. <laughs> Hoopers forever. How would you describe your game real quick? Just a little taste. If you ask anybody um, about my game, they'll say she's a shooter. Don't leave her open. Okay. Oh, so, hand down, man we, down. <laughs> yeah, don't really have a mid range, you know, more of a set shooter or go to the rack. So it's either or. <laughs> either or which means you're unguardable that's what that means yeah, to me you know? <laughs> <laughs> well I think the best part is now you get to work in basketball for mm -hmm. your job so tell us a little bit about your career path and about your current role with the NBA's Atlanta Hawks yeah so my career role uh, my current role is I'm the manager of corporate social responsibility which is a, another way of saying community engagement and so I get to wake up every morning and figure out how we, the Atlanta Hawks, can help the Atlanta community. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's really my, honestly, I can't think of anything else that I would love to do because it allows me to mix all of my passions, which are community service and basketball. And so, I mean, honestly, I don't know what else I would want to do right now. Um, but in the past, my my professional background is in college, collegiate, excuse me, and professional athletics. So mm -hmm. I've worked in basketball operations. I've worked in student athlete development. I've worked in ticket operations. Um, and community is really where my passion is. And so I'm here to stay in this sector. Um, you know, whether God has me with the Hawks for the next 10 years or someplace else, I know that it will involve community service and basketball. Well, I love when your passions just merge together. Yes. Like it just seems like a perfect dream job for you. I love that. And I also know being a woman in sports, it's not always the easiest. There are some challenges that can come up. What are some challenges that you face just being a female athlete, being in sports, being an executive and how you how have you overcome them? I think the biggest challenge for me has been dealing with imposter syndrome. And I think it can anybody can deal with imposter syndrome. And despite being successful in my past, I still find myself wondering, should I be in this room? Is what I'm gonna say, does this matter? And so I think the way that I've been able to overcome that is I have a village around me, mm -hmm. a village of women, men, mentors, my family, that really encourage me and remind me of the great things that I have done and that I will continue to do. Um, and I also believe that God has me where he wants me, when he wants me, around the people that he wants me. And so, you know, when I think about all those things, you know, how can I not feel successful and be successful? Yeah, the imposter syndrome is so loud sometimes. Like where, why? I, I just want to turn around and be like, shh. I know what I'm doing. I know right. I'm good at this. You know what I mean? But it's so real. And I'm so, so yeah. many people can relate to that. And especially in the position that you're in, 
we already talked about it. It's both with your passions mixed yeah. together. So you are exactly where you need to be. I love I that am. for you. I am. <laughs> and when I talk to other women about it, it's it's so it's so it's so amazing how women connect mm -hmm. based on that single topic because it it really impacts us all. It does. Um, and so yeah, yeah. I'm still well, working on it, you know. Yeah. But I've We're got a work in progress. Uh, yeah, I've got so it's much growth. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk okay. about the T1D community because that's why we're here. And I want to talk about you. So you were diagnosed at 11 years old way back then. Let's talk about how, you know, you struggled with body image and discussing your diagnosis with peers as you were a teen and a young adult. Tell me about that experience. Yeah, so like you said, I was diagnosed when I was 11. Um, I don't know anyone else at that age that had type one diabetes. I have a first cousin mm. that has type one, but he lived across the, across the country. So we didn't really grow up together and we didn't talk about our challenges. And, and so I didn't know anybody else that had type one diabetes. Um, so I was not open about it. Um, I was really mad at God, like, why me? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I did not talk about it. Um, I didn't let anyone help me. It was just me. It's, you know, until my husband, um, he's the only one that's ever given me a shot or put my CGM, CGM in. Um, <laughs> I struggled with once I got an insulin pump, you know, the insulin pump does not go with a cute tight dress or a cute crop top, you know. And so if there were times where I would take off my insulin pump because I thought it wasn't cute or people would make fun and ask, is it a beeper? Is, you know, is it a what is that? And so I struggled for a while with that. Um until probably my late 20s and early 30s. Mm -hmm. What yeah. was the thing that kind of got you over the hump or you were able to kind of accept it and say, like, this is me. This is who I am. If you really want to know, there's this young lady that I started following on Instagram. Thank God for social media. Social media can be mm -hmm. bad. But also, it has so many benefits. Yes. Um, she was the girlfriend of a guy that I went to school with at Georgia Tech. And he posted her and I was like, oh, she's so adorable. Let me click on her link, see what she's about. And she's a social media influencer for diabetes. And so I messaged her and she's young. She's like 24. She was 24 at the time. So I messaged her and I said, hey, you really inspired me. I love the fact that you don't hide your diabetes. You know, and we just connected. And then she got us all together. She got me and about eight other young ladies with type 1 diabetes together. We went to brunch. And we, that was the first time I had ever had a community of people that knew what I was going through, could relate. Mm -hmm. They were young. You know, I might have been the oldest one at 31 or 32. Um, and it was amazing. And so, you know, she and I have been doing some work together and we continue to talk. And I'm just like, you know, she can do it at that young age. Why, I'm 30. So why am I not doing this? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I can do this. I can I can educate people. I can be a role model for other for other, you know, young ladies or young people in general, just like she can or just like she did for me. And so I will probably always tell that story because had it not been for Kiva Cheney, I love you, Kiva. You know, I might not have decided I wanted to become an advocate like this. So mm. I it was her. I love that story. And you also mentioned your husband too, the first person you you trusted put on your CGM. That's a big deal. <laughs> yeah. Very big deal. It is. So I want to I want to talk about dating a little mm -hmm. bit because my husband, when we were dating, probably like the first three or four dates, he would just they were all ice cream shops. And I was like, oh, OK, <laughs> um, my numbers are like 400. I'm like, all right, I, I think I got to tell him that I'm a diabetic. So it right. took a little bit. But he was like, oh, my gosh, uh, there's a salad restaurant we can go to. Like, he's so cute. But I just want to know, when did you share your diagnosis with your husband? And what would you say to other women with type 1 diabetes trying to have that conversation or trying to, to date and have that conversation with their spouses? I told him on the first day. Um, <laughs> and it was hard. Because, you know, he was going to see it eventually. He was going to know eventually. And my husband and I kind of have a, a, a odd love story. You would have thought that we had been together for years the first day that, day that we met. And so we really clicked. And so I saw him as somebody that I could be involved with long term. And I know that the challenges of diabetes requires a support system. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was really trying to figure out if he was going to be able to be that support system that I needed him to be for the next 50, 60, 70 years. Um, and he 
he was very open to learning about it. I think he was a little afraid, though, because his grandfather passed from diabetes. Mm. And so I think there's always that fear that something could happen to me as his wife. But he's always like, babe, you know, what can I get you now? He can see on his phone, you know, what my readings are. And he'll send me messages like, babe, you're dropping low. What do you I need you to I need you to get it together or babe, you're going high. Did you take your medicine? And so I think it's very important for you to share with that person that you, you know, may be involved with, even your best friends, people that are close mm -hmm. to you in general, um, about the challenges that you're going through and and what it means to be type one, because you need that support system. And if they can't accept you, because type one comes with you, you might need to look yeah. someplace else, because it's a package <laughs> deal. Keep looking because it, it's a lot. It's a lot. And it's a lot goes in that. And like you said, that yeah. support system, like my husband has seen me literally in my highs and my lows. Like it is literally. not the same Jordan yeah. <laughs> during those times. Yeah. So that is what the support system is all about. And the next thing I want I want to talk about is, you know, family, because that comes with it. You you chose your husband to kind of build this family with and the support system with having a type one diabetes. I know you have a bonus son. I know you have a desire, a strong desire to be a mom. So how has type one diabetes played a role in you building your family? Yeah. So um, like you said, I do have a bonus baby. His name is Kenneth, a.k.a. Peanut. We call him Peanut. Um, he's 10 years old and he and I have known each other since he was one and a half. And he's been with me um, since he was four. So that is my child. You know, I've been a mom, a full time mom for the last six years. Um, and it is my desire, my husband's desire and my son's desire. He tells me all the time how he wants a sibling um, to build a family. And, you know, type that um, type one diabetes has played a little role in us being able to do that. Um, it's affected my fertility. I've, I've been diagnosed with premature ovarian failure. Um, which is the doctors think that either I wasn't born with the right amount of eggs, um, you know, maybe my eggs were killed off, so to speak, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and type one is an autoimmune disease. And so they think the cause behind it is also autoimmune. And so, you know, I believe in miracles. And if God wants us to have a baby, we will have one naturally. Um, but we've already started the process of, you know, trying to, to raise money and find funding for IVF so that we can do a donor egg if it's not in the car is supposed to do a natural, a natural birth. Um, but we will get pregnant mm -hmm. and we're going to have a healthy pregnancy and I'm going to keep my A1C all the way down where it should be. And we're going to build our family. And that's just that. And that's just that. I want to just give a round of applause. You said your A1C was down. Go ahead and just speak yes. it out in existence. Get that number that you want yes. and it's going to happen. Yes, we are <laughs> trending down. Last October, it was 8.5. I know that's terrible, but by December of last year, it was 7.5. And then I just went last week and it was 6.6. .6. So we are getting this A1C down and we're going to keep it down so that I can have a healthy pregnancy and be around a long time for my husband and my son and my new baby that's coming. Yes. <laughs> I can't wait. I'm invited to the baby shower. I'm already Absolutely. inviting myself. Okay, thanks. I'll be there. <laughs> you and your I husband. Wait. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. <laughs> I love that so much. Okay, let's get back to the incredible work that you do before I let you go. You are also a philanthropist at heart. Tell us about your goals and the mission of your new nonprofit. Yes, so I started a nonprofit called Diabeting the Odds in January. Um, I formed it in January, but we're going to launch later this year um, so that I can get everything organized and pop out on the scene, you know, ready. Um, but essentially, Diabetes in the Odds is, it is to empower people living with diabetes and people that support those that live with diabetes um, and living a healthy and vibrant life. And I want to show people that you can do whatever it is that you want to do. Diabetes does not have to stop you from doing it. You may have to modify how you do it, when you do it, but it doesn't have to stop you from doing whatever, whatever it is that you want to do. Um, and we'll, we're going to focus on three service pillars. One is athletes against diabetes because I'm an athlete and I was a college athlete with diabetes. The second one is going to be called sugar mommies and sugar daddies. And it's going to be for <laughs> people that are diabetic that want to have kids, whether you're a man or a woman, and maybe, you know, programming around how that may affect your ability to get pregnant. Um, and then, or if you have a child that has type one diabetes and you're a parent 
of a diabetic. Mm -hmm. so that programming will focus around that. And then the last one is just thriving with diabetes. It's more like a catch all. Um, and I want to highlight those that are um, living with diabetes every day and are conquering diabetes uh, one day at a time. So I am super excited about it. I don't know where it came from. It's like the Lord just dropped it right in my spirit <laughs> and he just saved it just for me. And so I'm excited about it. <laughs> I'm excited about it. That sounds perfect. Sounds perfect for you. Also going on with your passions, with helping the community. And now you're you're sprinkling in the type one diabetes community on top of that. Amazing. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you, Portia. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Just re-watching that video of Portia just got me so excited. I'm reading all of these comments and I hope we can clip these out and just make sure that we send these to her because she is an inspiration. She was so nervous about sharing her story, but I'm so glad that she did. It not only inspired me, but I know it inspired so many people who are watching Portia, you are amazing. You are the best. I can't wait for the baby shower. I'm inviting everybody in the chat to the baby shower as well. So we're going to be there. We're going to support you. I'm so, so excited for you. How great was that? But we still got more to come. We have two more guests to get to. So let's introduce our next guest. She is a Tony-nominated Broadway television and film actress known for originating the character of Emma Nolan in the Broadway production, The Prom. Caitlin Kinnanen began acting at the young age of three, and by 11, she had already performed her first professional show in the theatrical production of Annie. At 16, Caitlin relocated to New York City, made her Broadway debut in Spring Awakening. She has since appeared in numerous productions, including the Our Ladies pilot for CW, The Intern, Sweet Little Lies, It's Kind of a Funny Story, We Need to Talk About Kevin, Younger, American Vandal, The Nick, and Law and Order SVU. I know all you guys love that show. <laughs> Caitlin's versatility doesn't end with her acting skills. Her remarkable voice can be heard as Juniper on the podcast, The Castillo Protocol, Helix Station, featuring Gwendolyn Christie. She was also nominated for an Audi Award for narrating the audiobook Mary Jane and was handpicked by the Judy Bloom to narrate her book forever. Today, she joins us to share her personal story and present a special tribute to the award-winning actress and T1D advocate, Mary Tyler Moore. Please join me in welcoming the multi-talented Caitlin Kinnanen, who is joining us all the way from Iceland. Welcome, Caitlin. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Well, I can't wait to hear what you have prepared. So go ahead, take it away. All right, I will take it away. We got a little preview of some of this, but we're just going to walk through it. That's me. That's when I was eight. That is two weeks after I was diagnosed with diabetes. Um, so, yeah, I was diagnosed with diabetes when I was eight years old. Uh, until that moment, my life had been pretty predictable. No one in my family had diabetes, and I had never even heard of it. My parents had noticed that I was a little bit lethargic. I was drinking so much water and peeing even more, very common signs of type one diabetes. They knew something was up. They took me to our primary care physician. He checked my blood sugar and it was over 600. I remember the doctor telling my parents. I remember getting in an ambulance and being taken to the children's hospital. I remember pulling out my freshly placed IV in my sleep my first night there. And it's all just bits and pieces after that for me. Two weeks after that doctor's appointment and after my trip to Disneyland, <laughs> we were set free from the hospital and we were off on our own. My parents took care of everything. They made me feel safe and like nothing had changed in my life when in actuality, everything had. I now had to do shots in the morning every time I ate, every time my blood sugar was too high, and every night before I went to bed. I had to check my blood sugar every three hours to make sure that those shots were working well enough, but not too well. I quickly learned how to sleep through my mom checking my blood sugar at 3 a.m. and making me chug down a juice box all while I was asleep. I considered that a special skill for a very long time. In a matter of minutes, I had to become so aware of my body 
and how it felt, every little thing and how it affected it. But my parents and my family made it all feel normal. Like this was just a little blip that we had to get used to. Type one diabetes became our normal. It had to. Up until my diagnosis, I had been acting whenever I got the chance to. I took classes and participated in children's theater. My sister acted as well, and my mom did the sets and costumes. It was a family affair. Um, but when I was diagnosed, I had to take a break from it. My body had to adjust to this new way of being, and I had to figure out learn the learning curves. It took a minute, but we got there. A couple of years and a better understanding of diabetes later, I was back at it. Now I was balancing being on stage, singing and dancing with hiding juice boxes backstage in case I needed them. I kept acting. I got an insulin pump. It got easier. I could hide my pump in my costumes. I kept acting and I got a CGM. I could hide that too. I could feel confident going on stage and knowing that this new technology had my back. It would tell me what was going on and I could react quickly. It was getting easier. Differences were being made and research was being put to great use. Within all of this, acting accidentally and then very purposefully became my livelihood. I moved to New York City when I was 16 to make my Broadway debut. And a little over 10 years later, I was in my third Broadway show, The Prom, in which I played a teenage lesbian who just wanted to take her girlfriend to the prom. Um, there were fruit snacks and juice boxes hidden all over that set for me. Um, but I was nominated for a Tony Award for Best Leading Actress in a Musical for my role in that. It was a dream come true. It was something that I had been working so hard to achieve and I did it. And I was now in a position where I was pretty visible. People from all over the world were coming to see this show. Diabetics all over the world saw me living my dream, having a sometimes debilitating brain space taking up disease and living my life to the fullest. I now had people coming to me with questions on how to manage it all, how to handle it. And I got to share my experiences and insight with them something I do not take for granted. It wasn't until quite recently, 23 years into being a type one diabetic that I truly understood what all of it meant. I realized that there was so much of my diagnosis and early journey that I had no recollection of. Trauma had made me block it out. The impact that this diagnosis can have on your mental and physical health can be quite heavy. And I'm now really starting to process what I had to deal with as a child living with type 1. Going through all of adolescence with the weight of how this could affect me long term. What it meant for my body image, my comfort around being and telling people that I was struggling. And also being diagnosed with anxiety and depression. All things that can come hand in hand with type 1 diabetes. It is such an individual disease and everyone handles it differently. But in my journey, in sharing my story, I've been able to connect with more and more people who have gone through what I have gone through. Being able to communicate and share notes is everything. Having the door be open to share experiences and speak our truths and how to's makes it not only easier, but it makes us feel less alone in the process. Someone who made me feel less alone and like I could do anything was Mary Tyler Moore. She was one of the first celebrities I knew who had type one diabetes. Mary was a multi-talented, beloved and renowned actress, dancer and fierce advocate who was a voice to the fears and hopes of people living with and impacted by diabetes. Her portrayal of Mary Richards in the television series, The Mary Tyler Moore Show, which aired from 1970 to 1977, was revolutionary as it portrayed an independent single working woman who was a news producer. The show highlighted issues affecting women such as workplace discrimination and the fight for equal compensation, and it challenged traditional gender roles and stereotypes of women. Mary was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when she was 33. 
She was a fierce advocate for the diabetes community. She served as international chairman of JDRF from 1984 to 2017. She used her influence to bring government, scientists, and people living with diabetes together to further type 1 diabetes advocacy and help to raise billions of dollars for research to cure type 1 diabetes and its complications. One of her most significant achievements was increased congressional funding for the special diabetes, the special diabetes program at the National Institute of Health, the NIH which has accelerated the pace of type 1 diabetes research. Despite the daily burdens of this disease, Mary affected change with professionalism, grace, determination, and unbreakable optimism. As she worked tirelessly to relieve the burdens of type 1 diabetes for others, the disease impacted her own life eventually resulting in near blindness from diabetic retinal disease and ultimately stealing her autonomy and joy. Diabetic retinal disease, DRD, is the number one cause of blindness in working age adults worldwide. worldwide. Globally, more than 50 million people suffer from vision threatening DRD. Since Mary Tyler Moore's passing in 2017, Dr. S. Robert Levine, MD, her husband of over 30 years, has continued her legacy of leadership, serving as chair as JDRF's Government Relations Committee and a long-serving member of the International Board of Directors. While Mary did not make it to see a cure, the Mary Tyler Moore Vision Initiative, a joint effort of JDRF, the Mary, the Mary Tyler Moore and S. Robert Levine MD Charitable Foundation and the Elizabeth Weiser Cassell Diabetes Institute at the University of Michigan seeks to preserve and restore vision in people with diabetes, continuing Mary's vital work as it honors her legacy. Watching everything Mary had done and everything she continues to do has been so inspiring for me. I always knew that if she could do it, I could as well. Her advocacy for type 1 diabetes means so much to me, and it means so much to so many people. And it's our turn now to make a difference in others' lives. We have to carry her torch and continue to fund research and fight for a cure. Diabetes is a challenge every single day, but because of people like Mary Tyler Moore and organizations, like JDRF, one day soon type 1 diabetes can be a thing of the past. You can learn more about Mary's life and trailblazing career in the upcoming documentary HBO by HBO entitled Being Mary Tyler Moore, directed by Emmy-winning filmmaker James Adolphus and produced by Lena Waithe and Deborah Martin Chase. The film debuts this May on HBO and will be available to stream on HBO Max. Caitlin, thank you so, so much for sharing your story. I was over here getting very, very emotional because some days as a type 1 diabetic, it is so hard. And I'm just here in front of a computer, but you're on Broadway, <laughs> killing it, hiding your pump and doing all of those things. You are such an inspiration. And it was so amazing to hear who inspired you, Mary Tyler Moore. And Joanne in the chat, she got the hookup. She said the Mary Tyler Moore show is on Hulu. So we got to go and watch that. And, done and support and done. our other T1Ds. But Caitlin, thank you so, so much for sharing your story. Of I appreciate course. you so much. Thank, thank you. you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. You can hear more of Caitlin's story. She's going to be back with us for the next T1D Summit in May. So can't wait to hear that. That's going to focus around mental health. But a superstar, Caitlin Kinnanen. Wow. Wow. Okay. We have had some incredible guests so far, but we have one guest left. 
Save the best for last, Kelsey Bascom, an accomplished writer, actress, and diabetes advocate. In 2009, Kelsey was diagnosed with T1D and has since dedicated her platform to raising awareness through social media and her writing. Kelsey is best known for creating and writing and starring in the hilarious web series Mondays, which has amassed over 10 million views on YouTube. Oh my goodness. The series is based on her personal experience as a young woman. For her remarkable work, Kelsey was nominated for an outstanding writing in a comedy series, an outstanding lead actress in a comedy series by the LA Web Fest. Additionally, her web series was nominated for Best Webisode on the Holly Shorts Film Festival. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming Kelsey. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, that was such a nice intro. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Well, you've done all of those things. You deserve it. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. And let's just get right into it because okay. I have so much that I want to talk to you about. We're already matching with the pink. We got the memo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but we're here. We're here. But the first question I want to start with, you're an actress, you're a writer, you're a creator. When did you first realize that your passion was in the entertainment and, and filmmaking industry? Yeah, I think I've always kind of had a passion for filmmaking ever since I was like a little kid. I was running around with the camcorder and recording like the family vacations and making funny videos with my friends. And then in high school, I started taking classes at our local TV station and learning how to edit. And then I uh, applied to film school and I went to Loyola Marymount University and studied film there and I had some amazing internships. I I interned at a production company in London and at Lionsgate and then at Columbia Pictures. And um, yeah, then I, I started writing Mondays and now I'm working on quarter. Amazing. OK, so you're like, I'm not new to this. I'm true to this. This is how it has always been, which is so, so exciting. And I know, too, from being in a very male dominated field of sports, that being behind the camera can feel the same way and being a strong female presence in the room. What challenges have you faced kind of being that female voice in the room and how have you overcome those? Yeah, one of um the challenges I faced, especially with this, this project quarter, um, you know, it has a very strong message about female empowerment and finding your voice. And, um, after I wrote it, we started going out with it and kind of going for the com more commercial route to studios and they liked it. But like the biggest feedback, um, that we got was like, Oh, it's, it's really funny, but wouldn't it be better if it was a romantic comedy and she ended up with the guy and I was kind of like, well, that's not really the point of the movie. That's not really the message. And um, so we decided to kind of take a risk and do a more um, independent route and tell the story that we thought was important to tell. Telling the right story is so important. And being your biggest advocate for your work is also so important. So good for you. It doesn't always have to be. The prince charming at the end of the story. I It could be about me. I like that. I like that. Okay, so into your T1D journey, you were diagnosed at 17 years old. How did type 1 diabetic, type 1 diabetes affect your health as a woman, mentally and physically? Yeah, I think the mental part is something that a lot of people don't think of when you hear type 1 diabetes because you think like, oh, you know, you just take shots when you eat. That's not, that's Okay. Mm -hmm. And for me, just all the kind of constant planning and, and figuring out our doses. And there's just so many factors involved. Like, it's kind of crazy when you see the list, like it's everything from like, you know, the, the, the things like food, exercise, but also like weird things like, you know, if you're getting sick or your period or you didn't get a good night's sleep. And like, even I heard the weather can affect it. Oh my gosh. Like, yeah. Having all those things, I kind of realized that like I can only do the best that I can. And there's gonna be days where I'm super high or low and I just kind of have to go with the flow and know that that's gonna happen. And the other thing um, that was tough for me was um, body image with T1D. Mm -hmm. like, for a really long time, I, I hid my type one diabetes. I felt like I didn't wanna seem different, especially like 
I was diagnosed in high school and like just about to go into college and kind of start my dating life. And I didn't want to seem like, yeah, different, you know, it's like a weird time, like to have like, yeah, or a pump. And so I hit it for a long time. And now like, you would never know that. Like if you looked at my Instagram, almost every single picture is of me, like with one of my robot parts. Um, and I love showing them off now, but that's been a huge part of my kind of journey with T1D. That is so relatable because we all, I feel like we've all gone through that. Even though I was diagnosed in my twenties, it was very much a, okay, if you look at me, you can't tell if it's hiding, right? It's one of those, maybe a benefits of, of having T1D. You can't really tell if you just straight look at us, but we, I feel like we've all gone through that acceptance and I love your post. Show it off, show off all our robot parts. That's what makes us special. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Well, you mentioned dating. I have to ask, please share your journey with dating and T1D. I shared in the video with Portia how my husband thought he was killing me by taking me on all of these ice cream dates when we first started dating. I was like, okay, I think I should tell him that I'm a type 1 diabetic now. But what about you? What was your experience with dating? Yeah, dating is definitely interesting with T1D. I, I really related to that conversation you have with Portia because like for me, like being that at that age, I was kind of a late bloomer. I didn't really date in high school. So it really started in college and like trying to figure out how to tell guys that you're type one diabetic. Like I tried it before just like, but it, but it turned into this big, scary announcement where it's like something I have to tell you. And it's like, what is it? And it's like, I'm diabetic. And they're kind of like, what? So I kind of came up with this other technique at some point because I was hiding it and like some guys would never know I'm diabetic because like I'd be at on like a first date and I would just go to the bathroom, do my finger prick and my shot before the food came, come back out and like you never know. Mm -hmm. but then I kind of realized instead of doing that kind of big scary announcement at some point and making it into such a big deal, it would be better if I just act like it's normal because it is, it is my normal. So like I started doing this thing where like I'd be on a first date and we'd be talking and then be like, okay, the food would come. And I just would take out my, like my pouch and start unzipping it and open it up and like start to do the finger brick. And sometimes it was a really natural way for them to be like, oh, what's, what's that? What are you doing? I'd be like, oh, I'm diabetic, blah, blah, blah. But other times it'd be like, wait, what are you doing? Is that blood? Like what's going on? And like, I would know like, okay. It's probably not going to be a second date, but most of the time <laughs> they would be like, oh, what is that? Oh, I didn't know you're diabetic. And like, they would show an interest and ask questions. And, and then I would be like, okay, like he's, he's a keeper. Like, okay, this is, this is good. <laughs> Great test. Wow. That is genius. It's like, oh, does this does this finger prick bother you? Like, that's a great, I, I love that. That is a tip that everybody should use. Keep me updated. Let me see how that, how that goes. But um, I wanted to ask, you know, it is Women's History Month and the premiere of being Mary Tyler Moore document our documentary at South by Southwest. And we are paying honor to her. How, like, what does her advocacy work and legacy mean to you in the entertainment and film industry? How did she inspire you? Yeah, yeah, Mary is like an inspiration to me on a couple different levels because mm -hmm. one is like a woman in comedy. She really paved the way. I mean, she did this show about an independent woman um, who's, you know, single, focusing on her career, doesn't need a guy. And that had never been done before at the time. And also, like, she used humor to incorporate such, like, um, serious topics. Like, I know she made jokes about sex and birth control and even equal pay for women. So the fact that she did, did that is so empowering and so inspiring. And then to be diagnosed with T1D, like, while she's shooting a show on national television. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I think it's just so crazy. And I could also relate. I, I know a little bit about her story. She, she hid her T1D for, for a while. And then she became this huge advocate, you know, and did her work with JDRF for so many years and raised, you know, billions of dollars for research for T1D. And yeah, long story short, I just think she's so amazing and inspiring on so many levels. 
She is. She is. Oh, my goodness. I can't wait for that documentary. I think that's going to show such an insight on, like you said, she was on national television and her life changed (laughs) overnight. I could not could not relate because I was just a very small level for me and it was still very, very hard. So, so excited to hear that. But kind of going off of that, I'm so interested in the differences and I'm curious to pick your brain about the portrayal of type one diabetes on screen since way back in the day to now. And we're going to talk about quarter, but you know, steel magnolias, Julie Roberts had type one diabetes. That was 1989. And there was definitely this different portrayal than now. What are your thoughts on that and how type one diabetes is on screen? Yeah, so th- those kind of movies that were made, you know, 20, 20 years ago, I know they're, yeah, Still Magnolias and Panic Room. Uh, I think the big difference is they, they really dramatize um, T1D. Like, it's kind, of, it's kind of a scary thing in those movies. Mm-hmm. Like, I always get nervous watching them because I feel like when there's, like, a, a type 1 diabetic character, I don't know if they're going to make it to the end of the movie. And, <laughs> yeah, and so... That's the, I think the big difference now, like for me with quarter, it was really important to me that diabetes wasn't such a a scary thing. Like I wanted people to connect and relate to it. And I thought the best way to do that is actually through comedy, which you wouldn't expect, but I think, you know, having such a serious topic is easier to digest in a kind of comedic way and finding the lightness at certain moments. Mm Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I'm really excited to be part of kind of this new wave of representation for T1D and kind of yeah, doing it from a different perspective. Yeah, well, let's talk more about Quarter, because I know that that was an inspiration coming directly from your life. But I know that you are so excited about it. You're in post-production. So tell us a little bit more about it. What can we expect? Yeah, so Quarter uh, is a comedy. It's um, it's based on my personal experiences, um, like being a young woman in your 20s and then dealing with T1D at the same time. And it's very personal. I, I open up about a lot of things that I you know haven't told a lot of people until now. Mm. I kind of wrote it as a diary because I, I really wanted people to get inside my head. And, um, you know, we do a lot of fun things like talking to camera and going into animation and fantasies and flashbacks. And like, we do stuff like we go inside my body and see like immune system shoulders, soldiers attacking my pancreas. And Oh my gosh. Like go off into a fantasy where like, I imagine like what it would be like if I was in a movie, like a quiet place. And I realized like I'd be screwed because my CGM will go off. (laughs) And so I really tried to find the comedy in it. And I think it's going to be really funny and special. And it has a really great message about finding your voice and becoming more confident um, with yourself and also with with T1D. And um, the other thing that was really important when we were making it was I really wanted, you know, T1D representation in front and behind the camera. So we actually have quite a few T1D cast and crew members. I think I think we have over 20 now. And it's still growing, which is which is amazing. Oh my gosh, that's amazing! Yeah, and there was one really special um, day that we shot where my character, she's very shy and kind of introverted, and she goes to this party, and there's all these um, you know successful, cool women at the party that she's like kind of intimidated by. And I thought, wouldn't it be fun if I, we make all the women at the party T1Ds? And so I used my Instagram and like texting friends of friends and put together like a group of T1D women in LA and got them in the room. And it was so fun and special because, you know, we did the scenes, but in between the scenes, we were like sitting in a circle, sharing stories, sharing our, you know, our CGM numbers. And it was really special because a lot of us had never met other women around the same age living with type one diabetes and being in the same room and, Yeah, it was really amazing. Wow. To be a fly on that (laughs) wall, that seems incredible and way to use your platform to really send out that message. I cannot wait for this movie. I hope your character goes on a first date and pulls out the the finger pricker. I can't wait to see how that all (laughs) unfolds on screen. But where can everybody find you? Your Instagram is wonderful. Please plug it. 
Oh yeah, so um, we don't have a release date for quarter quite yet, but trust me, as soon as there are updates, I will be posting them everywhere. <laughs> um, and you can, yeah, you can follow me on Instagram at Kelsey Basco. Amazing. Thank you so much, Kelsey. Thank you for sharing your story. And we cannot wait to witness your diary kind of on the big screen of life as a T1D. Thank you, Kelsey. I'll be following along. Can't wait oh, yeah. for it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It was, it was such an honor to be part of this. Thank you. Thank you. We'll catch up soon. Oh, my goodness. You guys, that was so amazing. Everyone who has talked and shared their story, their expertise, their research. I've been gabbing for an hour and 15 minutes now. Thank you guys for hanging on with us. I, I Again, a special thanks to all of our guests for sharing their stories with us tonight. I'd also like to say a special thank you to our sponsors. You can learn more about the national partners who make the Type 1 Nation Virtual Summit possible and the latest in technology and T1D management at jdf.org backslash T-O-N Summit. And thank you to all of you for joining us, listening to me yell and get all excited. I just love, love talking with other women and I love talking about T1D so thank you for being here with us. And if you haven't already done so, please visit jdrf.org backslash T-O-N summit and register for the series because you won't want to miss the upcoming session in May focused on mental health. It's going to be amazing. This one was great. The first one, they're all going to be good. So make sure to come on back. Stay tuned for more information. Thank you all again and have a great, great rest of your evening. I'll see you next time.